and so then the part two, uh, well, not part two, sorry, but the second, um, or well, the third presentation, I guess, in part one is looking at the output. So this is um, the the final um, 30 minutes before the break, just looking at the output. Now, again, by request, this is um, aimed at a kind of an entry level. So some people are going to say, oh, this is so obvious. Why are you telling me this? But for other people, it'll be completely new. But hopefully for everyone, there'll be at least some useful information. So hopefully you can um, bear with me in that. So I will say that this is all set up in a in that um, Python notebook you, that displays on online. You can follow it online or you can download it and actually interactively execute the commands if you want. Um, I'm going to present it in um, a slideshow kind of mode. And but if a question comes up or we want to actually execute something live, I can just jump into the notebook and we can actually execute the, the live uh, notebook. But but just for purposes of presentation, I think it actually displays it nicer in, in the slide mode. So, um, but, le but let's see how it goes. This is, this is a bit of an experiment. OK, so looking at the output and diagnostics, I take it that can someone just confirm that you can see the screen well and this looks good? Yeah, excellent. Sorry, I just want to juggle my windows around a little bit. OK. So, okay, so the goal of this lesson basically is to help users get started with looking at the model output from Can ESM. And we're going to look at two things today. The first thing is the pre computed one dimensional runtime diagnostics via the RTD browser. So we've heard that name a lot of times now. We're actually going to use it in this session. And then the second thing that we're going to do is look at the full domain output, so like kind of 3D, 4D data. Um, via the CMAP6 style standardized NetCDF. So we're going to go into those two things. We're not going to try and go further upstream in the diagnostics pipeline. Um, we're going to just look at those two endpoints. Um, and so, yeah, this is a notebook. And, and here I'm using Python and X-Array because that's just, those are the tools that I use. But I'm really just illustrating to you principles and these concepts that I show you should transfer into any analysis package. Of course, the syntax and whatever is going to be different if you're a MATLAB user or an IDL user or something. But um, you know, I take it that probably a lot of people use Python, and so. Um, but don't don't get caught up on that detail. That's not really the important part. Yeah, and again, this notebook and so on is in that um, gitlab.com cp4c project. Okay, so basically, like what I want you to get out of this today, learning objectives to be able to use the runtime diagnostics browser to quickly look at 1D fields from runs um, to verify against reference simulations and as a kind of also to use this in a different way as kind of a sanity check if you're computing your own diagnostics. Do I know how to compute a global mean correctly? It's not necessarily always obvious. Um, so then also to learn to pause for data through the seamorized data structure that kind of um, briefly introduced there. And um, then also just to become aware that in CAN ESM, there's different model components that live on different grids in the atmosphere and ocean and land, and you know how to approach working with data on these different grids and what's appropriate and just a little bit of what they look like. So that's what we're going to go through, doing practical examples of just like making plots and loading the data. Um, OK, so just before we get there, just so that you have a view of where this comes from, there is this diagnostic pipeline. So this is kind of like a, a more detailed version of the diagram that um, Clint um, was showing earlier, where I'm just showing you all the kind of individual uh, steps. So there's really this, there's an extensive set of processing from um, what we call history files, which come out of the model. They're typically very big. They might be at six hour frequency. They, they would contain many variables per file typically. And there's a whole set of transformations that goes on to monthly mean those, to move them out of spectral space, to combine fields, to do a whole lot of operations. Um, and eventually you end up with these time series. The definition of those is that there's one variable per file instead of many variables per file. And that is the basis of the seamorization, so that conversion to the CMAP6 data standard. And eventually we end up with NetCDF files that are seamorized that are also one variable per file. That's the CMAP6 standard, that every file contains one variable, and it's got a very clear naming convention and so on. So we'll be working a lot with those. And then, as I also mentioned, we'll be working with these RTD. So the RTD actually get produced quite high up in the pipeline of basically the history files. There's a program, an RTD program, 
that com computes them in the atmosphere and computes them in the ocean. Um, and so we'll not be really delving into that, but we'll just be looking at the results of those the RTD files, and we'll actually not even be dealing with the files directly. We're just going to use this browser that that makes use of them. Um, so let's get into that. OK, so runtime diagnostics, just to repeat it, they are all one dimensional fields that represent either regional or global means that are computed for hundreds of variables in that diagnostic pipeline automatically kind of in parallel with the model. Every year, the RTD file grows by an additional year. It is done on annual on an annual basis, and yeah, we present this this website that is you know a tool for for viewing these things. So uh, let's go onto the wiki and and look at these things. Uh, so sorry, let me just get to the right place. The screen sharing is getting in my way. OK. Um, OK, so I'm going to open the reference runs table and I'm going to open the RTD browser. Can, I, can you just confirm that you're now actually seeing the, the browser? OK, yeah. Um, OK, so so when we've got this, so we've got this RTD browser, which is a dynamic website. And the main thing that we do is here under the run ID um, column, we enter in run IDs of runs we want to look at. So run IDs, like kind of Clint showed you, when you set up your run, you have to choose a run ID, which is a unique identifier of a run and it's got certain rules about um, exactly what it can contain but um, um, basically it's just a unique identifier so we've got ec reference runs and we've copied the rtd across to niagara so that it can be viewed so let's um, let's look at a historical experiment so i'm going to take the run id out of here out of this reference runs table and i'm going to put it into the browser I'm going to say update plot, and then that was when I cross my fingers. Come on, <laughs> Niagara or Arbutus Cloud, don't let us down. It takes a little bit sometimes, but it is going to pop up a plot. OK, so what we're looking at is annual screen temperature over the globe, so global mean screen temperature um, of this run that was done at Environment Canada that we submitted to CMIP6. OK, so I didn't have to go and do anything other than just like paste a run ID. So that's very nice. And if I go to this drop down menu at the top here, we'll see that there's hundreds and hundreds of variables, which are these different quantities that we could look at. So for instance, I could look at 3D ocean temperature um, in the ocean and um, it will update. And OK, now I'm seeing oh, ocean temperatures also increased during the historical period. OK, but maybe something else like I want to look at precipitation, annual precipitation rate over the globe. How, how does that change? So I can basically dynamically select any of these different variables and it will, with its time lag. <laughs> okay, so you can see some change in precipitation. Ooh, what happened? There's probably some volcanic thing going on, right? Okay, so um, I will admit that exactly knowing <laughs> what the names of these things are and what they correspond to, there's not currently a super good way to do that, but the names are in there and there is a search bar. So if I want to search for things, I can I can kind of try and use that and should be. So if I want, for example, sea ice, OK, OK, sea ice. OK, so here I'm seeing a bunch of sea ice variables. It brings it to the top. So there is a way to try and of, to try kind of uh, find those things. Um, and so I could look at hopefully this works. Um, I can look at different different variables. OK, so sea ice area in March in the Northern Hemisphere declines. OK, so. Um, so so that's basically how they work and uh, what so now what I want to do is say I want to compare two runs. OK, so this is the Environment Canada run, right? But what about on Niagara? OK, so on Niagara we redid um, or we re we did a, a historical run for reference on Niagara. So let me take that and I can paste that into the second second one here and say update plot. And after a brief delay, <laughs> that run will show up and we can um, see how these two runs compare and we could compare uh, multiple runs uh, on this thing. OK, so here we go. So now I've got the two runs. Um, the original one that was from Environment Canada, and then this this number two in the kind of more purpley color, which is, is from Niagara. So 
okay, what do we expect? Well, we don't expect the climate, oh, sorry, we don't expect the bit pattern to be exactly the same because it's a different machine. The bit pattern is different. It's a different realization of climate. Oh, sorry, different realization of, yeah, different, different realization, but the climate change signal is the same. Like you can see that it's very consistent. Um, you know, um, we could look at different things like, yeah, if we went to the 3D mean temperature, we would see that they basically warm at the same rate. Or if we, you know, we could look at the top of atmosphere radiation, let's say that's a, a nice indicator of climate change. We're going to see that that's very similar in these two runs. So, um, yeah. So there, there's top of atmosphere radiation. So I can kind of calibrate my expectations a little bit, or I can check on things. Um, I'm going to just go back to screen temperature. So that now that that was moving across the machines, but imagine if I redid another run on Niagara, which I have done. So I've redone, I repeated some months later, a second historical run, and I, it's called O3 here. And I'm just going to update that. And um, so that run will come on here. Now for this run, because I did both runs on Niagara, I didn't change anything. I just did that copy and paste method, basically. I would expect this to be exactly the same. And that's what you can see now. I've got three runs and two of them are lying exactly on top of each other here. They're a bit identical. And we could go to basically any variable and we would see that that is true. Um, so let me just to kind of make that clearer, I'm just going to take off the Environment Canada run, and I'm just going to zoom in to maybe, I'm just showing you a few extra functionalities here. I'm just going to zoom into, let's say, 18, 1870. I just very briefly asked something, uh, Neil, yeah. sorry. Uh, so the difference between the Canada run or the run that was done on PPP and the one that was done on Niagara, is that only due to differences in the computational environment, or is there any kind of setup that has changed? Because that seems to be a rather big discrepancy for just being a different machine no, basically. It's, it's, I mean it's not a I mean I don't know what you would say as a big discrepancy like we've done like okay yeah there's a whole technical report we've done really extensive testing in different ways um, and th those runs the climate and pre-i control runs and historical runs the climate the climate or the climate change is the same like if I put up a 50 member ensemble of what we've done in Environment Canada this Niagara run easily falls inside that the climate is the same. The bit pattern is different <clears throat> because we can't avoid it. Um, there is obviously this difference in setup, like the MZ thing versus the internal EC system. But within e EC, we have both. And within EC, we can verify that those two are bit identical. So there's no difference between using MZ or not using MZ. But of course, when you change to a different computer, you can't maintain the bit pattern. Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's just say I take off um, sorry, you just, sorry, you know, just to jump in. Um, for the last test that you showed, uh, you, you convinced me that this, the bitmap is, is the bit pattern is is is, uh, is identical, but there is kind of an element of luck in that, right? Unless, unless it, uh, one of the questions I had is whether Kenny SM is set up for bit re re reproducibility. Um, be, but if you if you had a change in the, any of the math libraries, or if there was a you know. If, if, if um, there was a hardware swap or something, you know, that happened, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily guaranteed that you'll get bit reproducibility from runs that are sort of spaced apart by uh, several months. I just don't want users to be confused. But it's a very high standard. I don't know if uh, Kenny SM is set so that yeah, that Kenny, is, Kenny is SM maintains that's 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 <laughs> the standard that we maintain. Um, that's what okay. I would expect of Niagara too. Um, I mean, if they violate that without notifying users, well, okay, I don't know. There's no, something about scientific reproducibility, but, but you know, we we do load specific versions of the modules and so on. So if they install a new module environment, we don't necessarily get affected by that. So I would hope that it doesn't. Of course, when you move it to a new machine, when there's a replacement for Niagara or whatever, we'll have to re-verify. But I would I would hope that with on this machine, unless we make an announcement. But yeah, the, this is a good thing. Like, you know, internally we do runs kind of like automatically to verify that nothing changes. Like, yes, the technical guys don't switch out something that no one else knows about. It's something that we can talk about on Niagara too. But but so far it's these are months and months apart and they're identical. Yeah. Okay. That's which is great and very like a really nice standard for uh, you know, checking if you're doing things right. Um, but those things can but it's also very fragile, right? Any change. Any change can, can lead to it, you know, a change in one bit will eventually propagate to, to a, a divergence. So 
So yeah. uh, okay. it's it's something that and, and people might not realize, or there might be some yeah an environment change that didn't, you know maybe that, that happened but wasn't uh, but the, a new user wasn't informed somebody running it for the first time that kind of thing. Uh, I can just imagine that some of our older runs as we go along in, in, in say in three years but before a hardware change, but you know there there might be some subtle things that come in where where uh, bit reproducibility is violated. I'll leave with that. Um, OK, so I mean, I think the point here is just really to illustrate the RTD as a tool. And so I think that's yeah. kind of enough on that for for now. And we'll carry on with the 3D output just to stay on time. But yeah, we these things about like maintaining but identity over time and stuff. These are kind of bigger technical issues for CP4C to discuss. So yeah, I, we can maybe come back to that in the future. But yeah, it's it's a good point. It, it's, it's not guaranteed, but so far it's always been true. And then can you say we do maintain that standard? Um, OK, so let's move on to the 2D output. Um, so we're talking about the CMRI's net CDF. Um, so CMUP 6 defined a comprehensive data request, includes a naming convention, metadata, and standards like CF convention standards for the files. Um, CMRization, as we said, is the process of converting data to the standard, and it's done for Niagara Run. So I, as I mentioned yesterday, I think this is a really nice thing that we're happy to provide to people. Like, I don't think any other climate model in the world does that for external users. So um, yeah, I mean, I think we're actually not doing bad when you look at the resources that we have. I think we're doing pretty good. Um, so the data structure and format should be very familiar to anyone that's done any kind of CMAP analysis. So it's an easy entry point. Of course, it's new for some people, but, but for many people, it'd be quite familiar and standard. There's lots of help online about using tools to pause this and so on. Um, and the CMRI's data, in our setup goes into a directory structure, which is at output and then year, and then in a place called NC output forward slash CMAP6. So Clint kind of showed this quickly, but that's where it goes. When you do your run, there'll be an output directory below that a year and then NC output. Uh, could we just mute people that aren't muted? Because there's kind of like quite a lot of feedback coming. Um, okay, so yeah, you know, if you have information, if you need more information about the CMIP6 data request, like oh, what are all the names and all that kind of stuff, because it is, if you're not familiar with it, there are a lot of like short names and so on that are not necessarily obvious, but they have a website that you can go to to figure that out. Um, okay, so if we look below that directory that we were just talking about, we'll see this kind of tree structure, and it's treed such that there's. Um, there's a there's a project which is um, CMIP in this case. There's an organization CP4C is is our organization here. We've got a source ID that's the model name CANESM51, an experiment which is the PI control which is the example that I'm showing today. Then we have something called the member ID. This is like the realization of the climate, and then below that a bunch of tables for different kind of realms of frequencies. Um, so the, this, you know, AMON for the atmosphere monthly or OMON for the ocean monthly, for example. So we'll just look a little bit more at OMON. So if we went below the OMON um, table, then we would see a structure that looked like this. So at the top, there would be something like AJSSC. That's the, one of these short names for a variable that you can either find what that means on the CMIP6 data request web page or if you come down to the file, you, and we'll do this in a second, you can interrogate that file metadata and um, find out what the long name is. But there's also some other indicators here. There's a version number, which isn't too important, and there's, there's something called GN. That just means that it's on the native grid. For some models, you'll see, not our models, but for other CMO6 models, you might see that they have GR. They have been regridded, but we present everything on the native grid. So that's what it looks like if you go into that structure. And so now let's just dive into some examples. Like what we're going to do is we're going to look at surface air temperature um, in the atmosphere, and that's called TAS in CMIP6. And it's going to look at it monthly means from the AMON table. So if you could find that file in that structure, and you could use a, a command line tool, like a shell tool, like NC dump minus H to examine the metadata of that file. For many people, this would be super familiar, but we're just going to look at the metadata straight in Python. Um, same. Same result. So um, again, this is Python specific, and you could follow this in detail in the notebook. But you know, I'm just going to basically load in that TAS data from that path as a as an X-array. And once I do that, I can look at the attributes. And the attributes. This is the same thing that you'd get if you did the NC dump. It, the global attributes have a bunch of information about, for example, what the parent run was, i.e., where the restarts came from, um, the parent branch time. 
um, how it was branched, and a, a bunch of other information, general information in the in the global attributes. But we can also look at attributes <laughs> for the actual individual variable. So if we look at, sorry, can we mute? Your, Katie, could you mute users that aren't? Because we're just getting a lot of feedback. Um, so for um, for specific variables, um, you can also look at the metadata. And so here we're looking at the metadata for TAS. And what we see is that there's 132 time steps. So that's 132 months, which is 11 years. We've got lat 64 and long 128. So it's latitude, longitude, 64 by 128. That's the T63 grid from the atmosphere. So that's in Kenny SM5, atmosphere is on T63 um, Gaussian grid. And, and so that that's what this data um, is for 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 surface air temperature. And you can also see that there's some other things like the long name is near surface air temperature, and you can see some things about the provenance of it. We can also see the cell measure that it's got an associated area area cell A that will come back to be important in a second. So yeah, the metadata is useful to learn about what is the contents of these files, and it can provide you a lot of information. Okay, I've said all of those things. Those are just notes for the notebook purpose. Okay, so then having done that, you know, we can plot the data, and um, we um, so let's just plot the first month of the data, and you know, you would get a map like that. It looks kind of sensible. It's got latitude, longitude, surface air temperature. You know, the, I'm not really teaching you how to plot. I'm just showing you that like this is the kind of contents that's in in those files. And um, but now I want to illustrate a concept. So let's say that we let's say we want to calculate the global mean air temperature. Well, that's kind of a common thing. OK, so I can take my my data set. I can mean it over all latitudes and longitudes. And let's say I want to compute the annual mean too. So I'm going to group by and this is X array syntax. But however you do it, you could use CDO or whatever. OK, well, I compute an annual mean and I'm going to convert from um, from uh, from K to, to C. And then I'm going to plot it and print out the value. OK, so here I get a time series of global mean temperature and I, and I have a value of four. OK, so. If you know anything about global climate, you're probably thinking four sounds pretty cold. <laughs> so then the question is. Is it the model that produced a funny result in the simulation or? Did I do this calculation wrong? And so this is a good principle to apply whenever you're trying to compute something from the 2D metrics. You can use the runtime diagnostics to help you understand have I computed a global mean correctly in this particular instance? And it can get quite complicated when you're computing global means or volume means for the ocean or whatever. So if we go back to that RTD, I'm not going to go back to the RTD, I just put the slide in. But if we went and pulled up the same run on the RTD, this is what we would see for annual global screen temperature. And we would see that actually it's got a temperature more like 13.3 and it's got a very different pattern than what we calculated. So, OK, so we did something wrong. And the, what I'm illustrating here is just the concept that you can use the RTD as a cross check for calculations that you do. And then you might apply your calculations to other variables that aren't in the RTD, but it's just a basis of do I do this calculation in general correctly? OK, so I, I did that mistake on purpose, and what I did was not compute an area weighted mean. This is kind of like a rookie mistake. You have to compute area weighted mean. So let's do that. OK, so I can load an, that area cell A measure, which is in a different file in, in that same structure. I can load up the areas. I can compute an area weighted mean instead of just a, a straight um, average. I, I compute the annual mean again and, and convert it um, to Celsius. And now I get a pattern. And I also get a value that's exactly the same as was in the RTD. So you can see this pattern. It had basically 13.3. Now I have that same pattern and I have the value of 13.3. OK, so now I'm happy. I've done a calculation out of the 2D data that produced the same result as the RTD. Now I feel confident um, that I'm doing uh, the calculation correctly. OK, so I know that we are kind of getting short on time so i think i'm just going to go a little bit quickly through an ocean one just to illustrate the different grid and then um then we'll kind of go on to the break okay so for for ocean there's many fields out of the ocean of course but one of them like potential temperature is called theta o and we can take that out of the monthly table from the ocean we can load it up and again we can look at the metadata and if we do that what we'll see is okay i've still got 11 years of data 132 months but I've got 45 vertical levels 
because now I'm a 3D data set. I'm not just surface air temperature. I'm 3D, uh, 3D ocean temperature, so I've got 45 vertical levels. And we can also see that I don't have Latin long here. I've got I and J. And that's because the ocean data is on this tripolar grid, and we're shipping you that native grid. So there are latitudes and longitudes, but these are two-dimensional arrays um, because because this is like a curved linear grid, right? So um, yeah, it's not something that's exactly going to render easily into like map projections and that kind of thing, um, depending on, on the tools that you're using. So yeah, you have to be aware of that, that the ocean is on this tripolar um, orca grid. And commonly people might want to remap that to have it in a more standard format. So but let's just plot the temperature. Let's just select a level first time step and plot it at a thousand meters. Okay, we can do that. And if we do it, we'll see here we don't get Latin long. We get I and J indices. And if we took just one of these indices, like if we just went along a line of J, we would not, it's not the same as going along a line of latitude. Or, or, yeah, it's not, it's not like all the same latitude along there. So you have to be careful of that. But we can still plot a map. It looks a bit funny in kind of the continents because of this weird tripolar grid. So let's just say, okay, we're going to regrid it. And you can regrid it, whatever your tool chain is, but I'm just going to use here in this notebook XCSMF and just do a very simple bilinear remapping to a standard one by one grid. And so I can just remap the data set. For people that know X-ray, this is nothing super special, but there's other ways to do this, of course. But then I can come and plot my remap data set. And now I can see that I am in latitude and longitude space. And I can see that, um, yeah, the continental configuration, you know, like looks a little bit different because that tripolar grid has been kind of like unfolded into onto the standard grid. So I think the, you know, the point that I'm trying to illustrate here more than anything is just there are different grids. There is this tripolar grid. Be aware of that if you're using the data. And if you want to do something like plot a zonal mean in the ocean, you can't just compute the zonal mean of the native grid and say, oh, well, that's a valid zonal mean. It's not. You'll be a, a mean across you know, rows of J, not 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 of latitude. So if I want to compute a zonal mean section, which people commonly do for the ocean, which might look like this, I must use pref you know that remap data set in order for it, you know, I must first personally remap the data set for it for it to produce um, a valid field. Okay, I'm just going to show one super quick last thing just so I can say something about land. The detail here isn't super important. I'm loading land carbon flux. It's a variable called NPP. I load that up. What I want to em emphasize here is that land, so again, we've got 132 months, but we've got that lat long 64128 again. As was mentioned yesterday, this is because the land lives on the atmospheric grid. So this is the same T63 grid from the atmosphere as we saw from TAS. The land data is on the same grid. But of course, where, whereas many atmospheric variables are defined everywhere, i.e. Over, over land and ocean, of course land is <laughs> only defined over land. So let's just plot the first time step of this NPP variable. Um, and we will see what we kind of expect, that there's values that exist over land, but not values that exist over ocean. So, um, yes. Okay, that was kind of a whirlwind tour. Sorry, I know we went a bit over and it was a bit fast, but that notebook is there. People could step through that at their own pace. You could execute that. You could point it towards your own runs, and that should give you a good starting point for looking at the data. So, um, yeah, I'll take any questions that there are, but also recognizing that we're going on to the break. So if anyone wants to step away for your for the break, then yeah, please go ahead and we'll reconvene, um, I think, you know, just after 2.30 for people in the East or, or 11.30 um, in the West. Uh, Ivy. Thanks, Neil, for that really nice overview. Very helpful. I was just wondering for the runtime diagnostics, um, do all of the variables that you either uh, output through default by default or that you um, that you output manually do they all show up in the runtime diagnostics and then also do they follow the naming convention in the model or does it go according to CMIP or yeah 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 all good questions okay so yeah for the uh, I'll just stop sharing uh, for the RTD no, things do not show up automatically, like per se, like um, there, there's an RTD script which computes fields and a lot of them are kind of pretty heavily derivative fields, you know, not just 
a mean like some of them are just means of an array that was in the model but a lot of them are like quite detailed calculations and they're things that people have identified over time of hey this is a useful thing for us to look at in the model so there's kind of like a, a library of variables of interest let's say or, or metrics of interest that's been built up that are implemented in that runtime diagnostics just because you add a new array into the model doesn't mean that it shows up in the rtd you would have to add a computation in the rtd to to process that field and and to, to produce it um so that, i think that's the first question i think the second part of the question is the kind of naming convention now i'll admit that that's a bit of a challenge it's um, and there's even variables in there where if you select them, they won't actually bring anything up because there's some things that were for like old Kenny SM2 and there's some things like a lot of the Nemo fields actually have like Nemo in brackets because that's indicating oh it's working for that version of the model. So I'll fully admit that that part of it isn't kind of perfect or super intuitive, but there are a lot of variables there where you can just kind of find it by saying, oh, if I just type precipitation, I'll get something or if I just type sea ice, I'll get something. Um, there are some things that they have the short name like when I put up precipitation, I don't know if you've noticed that, but I type PCP and that's just because I know that that's the short name for it. And I think there's some of those where there probably is a connection to the upstream variable name in, in CanAM, for instance. Um, so I'll point out in that sense, we do have a variable dictionary on the wiki that kind of provides a list of all the names of the variables in the atmosphere. So that could be another thing if you were doing searches or oh, if I type precip I don't get what I want but maybe I could go look up what I know the name is in that table so yeah there is a table on the wiki of all the names okay thanks that would be helpful good to know yeah Neil yeah yeah so you probably mentioned this too but I might have missed it um the, the only runs that are are the only runs that are accessible for the RTD the ones that you've done under CP4C or if I do runs under my own account on Niagara, am I able to use the RTD as well? Um, okay, so if you do runs in your own account, it will compute the RTD and it will make the files, but you won't have right permission to put the files into this, because of course that browser needs to look it needs to know where to look for the files to, that's what to i was yeah that's what and so that saying. that's where kind of i mentioned being part of cp4c is this like value added thing that you get basically <laughs> right permission to put things into that fold that's really at this time one of the big things that um yeah you're getting as opposed to uh, and including like you know obviously the compute allocation and stuff so i mean yeah. if you're planning to do that i mean i would say just reach out to to Paul and and co and become a member of CP4C and yeah that, that is I don't think there's a big barrier on that um yeah I think Katie might have mentioned you're not currently able to take any new people but I might have misunderstood that I'll let Paul and Katie speak to that but I, I don't Paul shaking his head oh, okay, <laughs> no. I'm sure he didn't say that just already. for the workshop just for the workshop oh, oh just for the workshop just for the workshop no 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 it's completely open Neil it's very much I mean the, but for allocations practically speaking like for you that it has to be a PI of a research group who can uh, qualify for uh, you just have to be you have to qualify for a DRAC account which you know obviously you do um, but uh, anybody can join the, the the group um, we're really open and we really would love people to join because then then we can get a sense of demand and need um, and all that so please 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 don't think that we're we're full or anything um, as more people join hopefully we'll be able to help each other out more and it'll become you know there'll be less of a support issue actually as as we sort of gain gain expertise so you're very you're more than welcome. Uh, in fact, just just sign them up and <laughs> sign <laughs> me up. <laughs> and then, uh, no, but we consider have this my request. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so but, yeah, the, the the access to the so the, the data gets written to this Arbutus machine, and then we're using the cloud account we have to to generate the RTD diagnostics like uh, on a regular, uh, just on an automated job. So and just Neil, I I know this sounds really naive, but I just wanted to make sure Neil sort. Um, if you so you can submit your job to your own, uh, you know, with it with this learn script, you 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 can use your own projects uh, tag for um, for doing a long production run 
but you can still have the RTD uh, load uh, into, uh, or, or the, the time series files, uh, the RTD files load onto the common uh, uh, um, CP4C account. Is that, that's correct, right? Yeah, and we didn't exactly okay. say that. Maybe we should explain it a bit more, but that's actually, that would be the default situation. So the default situation is that, you know, you go to your own scratch, which you own, not CB4C, you would do the run there, all the content would apply, accrue there. By default, if you don't change anything, it will run under whatever your default um, account is on Niagara. And yeah, if you have permission to write to the CP4C space, it will write the RTD there. I think actually right now, if you don't have permission, it will probably crash, but we can just comment out one line to fix that. But We'll 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 get yeah we'll improve that but um yeah so basically that's the default and so if, if for people that are in CP4C that actually want to run under the CP4C RPP there's an extra step that you have to do you have to put a you have to explicitly say what the account is that you want to run under if you don't want it to just be your default so yeah and and we're still under subscribed on the uh, the CP4C. Uh, allocation, which is called RPP, the Research Portal Platform. We're still, you know, there's still, um, it, it's a fair share allocation, just like it is for all Compute Canada, uh, Iraq. And so, um, but right now, we're, it's not overused. We're, we're starting to use a good fraction of it, but we should, I would love to see it overused. So I, I definitely welcome users to do lots of test runs and maybe the production runs on our on on uh, cp4c to demonstrate that you know it is something that's needed um yeah so i'm glad this came up neil because yeah you're you're more than welcome i mean the whole purpose here is to get this uh working for everybody um i just want to kind of touch on that i didn't go into this because didn't really have time um but you can uh change your default slurm account that you submit jobs to uh just by mod putting some environment variables into your bash rc file on niagara uh, there's pretty good documentation for it on the DRAC website, but yeah, uh, that's a pretty simple thing to do. Uh, then, because like you saw for me, I was submitting default under the RPP for CP4C, uh, and that's because I've modified those defaults. So, so I, the basic thing is we have we have 200, we have 100 core years, but that does allow us to, you know, uh, do short jobs of, on six nodes, right? Like which is 240 cores. Uh, but we could presumably only do that sort of like half of, for half of the two-week period, so say for one week. But again, we're we're not anywhere close, I don't think, to to blowing through that. And even if we did start to blow through it, there would be no down, negative consequence until like there was no room left in uh, like the machine as a whole. So, so I, I it would be great if we could really start using that allocation, especially in this last year. Uh, so, uh, so we could tell, uh, you know, t tell the uh, the Iraq that this is what this is what we really do need this uh, allocation. So don't feel bad about using it. Um, you know, it's definitely if, if if you if you want to get started on the model and if you don't want to use your own stuff, then start using ours. Start using the collective stuff, and then we'll we'll see if it becomes a problem. I hope that doesn't. She does. She might hear about it more. <laughs> I mean, that's basically it is for everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to make a note, Neil. I, I think the um, the uh, the default is actually to run on Paul's allocation, and the <laughs> and that has that been changed now? Like no, it's, it's never been that. I mean, it would be for you because you're by default under Paul's allocation, but there's no account specified. There's no account specified in those submission jobs, so it will run mm -hmm. under for the individual user. Like if I submit without changing anything, it will just run under my personal allocation and SWART. If yeah. I want to run it under the RPP, I have to explicitly tell it to run under that account. But for by the same token, if um, Ivy or someone else submitted a job, it would run under whatever their by default by their default you know allocation is unless they explicitly make a change yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i see that now yeah 